Hello everyone. Um, good evening. I'm Emily Orford from Pluto Press and welcome to what will be an illuminating and inspiring event with Aaron Jaffe and Sarah Farris, which will bring theory and specifically social reproduction theory into the realm of activism and contemporary struggle. Now, before we start the event properly, I've got a brief announcement. Uh, the pandemic is an existential threat to smaller independent publishers like ourselves. With the disruption to the book trade, we're struggling to keep our heads above water. To help see us through, we've set up a Patreon offering. Subscriptions cost as little as three pounds per month, and the benefits include eBooks, merchandise, special gifts, extended versions of our podcast, Radicals in Conversation, and much more. Head over to Patreon forward slash Pluto Press and see for yourselves. Now tonight's event is called Social Reproduction Theory and the Socialist Horizon, which is also the title of Aaron's new book, which is out later this year. A social reproduction theory is not a new concept, especially for readers of Marx. Recently, however, we've seen an explosion in its popularity, with the theory being discussed in more mainstream channels as world events, including the coronavirus pandemic, bring it into sharp relief. It's also been developed from within the radical left over the last few years by writers such as Tithi Bhattacharya, Susan Ferguson, and of course, Aaron Jaffe. Many of these new ideas can be found in our book series, Mapping Social Reproduction Theory, which you can find on our website, plutobooks.com. So joining us today, we have uh, Aaron Jaffe, Assistant Professor of Philosophy and Liberal Arts at the Juilliard School in New York, and Sarah Farris, Senior Lecturer at Sociology in Goldsmiths, University of London, and the author of In the Name of Women's Rights. Please feel free to pop any questions you have for Aaron and Sarah in the chat, as there will be a Q&A section or throughout the event, we'll be taking questions from you guys. So pop them in there and we'll feed them to Aaron and Sarah. Okay, thanks very much. Yes, thanks, uh, Emily. Um, I will start uh, by saying a few words about Aaron's book. Well, first of all, I want to um, thank Aaron for writing this book. Um, because I, for me, it's, uh, it's been really a very illuminating, uh, clarifying, uh, and really engaging uh, experience reading this book in, in so many ways. And I think in this book, actually, Aaron uh, is uh, sometimes too modest in uh, presenting his work as aiming to defend social reproduction theory and uh, help to develop it. And I think it's a little bit modest because I think that in, in, in this work, actually, Aaron does much more than that. And I think what he tries to do successfully, in my view, is to develop social reproduction theory into a coherent social theory. And I would even say a social philosophy. Um, why I say this? Uh, there has been uh, lots of work recently, as Emily already said, with an explosion of uh, texts and articles on uh, social reproduction theory from different angles, uh, linking them to different uh, theoretical traditions and looking at different aspects of Marx uh, in relation to social reproduction theory, etc. And uh, Aaron duly cites and, and refers uh, to, to all that. But I think that some of the recent uh, and uh, uh, I would say even best work on social reproduction theory has been an attempt at uh, grappling with the past, particularly the domestic labor debate uh, or the wages of housework uh, um, debate and campaigns. So it has been a way of reckoning with these, uh, um, with these past traditions and reflections in order to understand how to rethink and reactualize those reflections and work in the present, um, clearly to reflect the changes that have occurred. Um, so I think Aaron's book in this sense goes one step forward uh, by attempting to think through the philosophical foundations of social reproduction theory in order to develop it into a, a social theory, a proper social theory, uh, but a social theory in the Marxist sense that is a revolutionary theory. So a theory that aims to change uh, the state of things, the current state of things. So let me give you some examples of, uh, um, of this. First, I particularly like the way Aaron describes social reproduction theory as uh, um, combining, including those set of theories that draw from ways, this is actually the expression that he uses, draw from ways that Marxist feminists try to connect the women's oppression, the social violences tied to being a woman to exploitation. 
the social violence tied to exchanging one's labor power for a wage. So women's oppression and exploitation, this is the fundamental link that the social reproduction theory uh, wants to think, to deeply understand and, and, and to change. So thinking this connection through and through is to me the golden thread of this book. And I think in doing this, Aaron is, uh, um, not only does it successfully, but he does it in a way that is incredibly useful for everyone interested in social reproduction theory. So as Aaron notes, social reproduction theory um, can produce a, a, a range of clear accounts of the world and uh, very pertinent social analysis. And uh, very importantly for any good revolutionary theory, these social analysis are not uh, just neutral descriptions of the world, but at the same time, they, uh, they also can, can develop criticisms of them. So the, the theory uh, can develop immanent rather than external standards for critical judgments. I, I think this is a very important reflection on the power of social reproduction theory, um, which is uh, its ability for self or immanent critique, <laughs> excuse me, that enables it to be, um, to be corrected, to be changed and constantly, um, in fact, uh, um, looked at in, uh, from the point of view of the things that really uh, need to be, to be corrected and looked at, not only in light of empirical or historical changes, but also on the basis of its uh, foundational uh, principles. So on this basis, um, all chapters in the book are really, uh, first of all, the book is really very well written, is enjoyable, is clear, and uh, um, all chapters in the book uh, are particularly enjoyable because they develop one aspect of, of the theory while using actual struggles as examples and as constant terms of references. So we don't have just these uh, um, very intense uh, and uh, um, sometimes difficult theoretical reflections, but they are constantly looking at also very specific uh, examples. And here I wanted to highlight some of the, the, the chapters and the sections that I enjoyed in particular. Um, the second chapter, for example, that focuses on labor powers unreali as unrealized uh, potentials to satisfy needs. Um, so here Aaron tries to understand uh, uh, in a way that I think is also very novel, uh, how labor power, um, what labor power can, but also cannot do. So here um, Aaron really um, help us to think how social reproduction theory can value the wealth of strategies for need satisfying activity over and against the way capital's demand for self-valorization, here I'm quoting from some of his work, constraints and distorts the development of human powers, preventing them from satisfying human ends. So in this way, social reproduction theory can show how capitalist social relations not only make and rely on labor powers, but also but they do so in problematic and disempower, disempowering ways. I think this is a very powerful way of framing this. Um, because I think here Aaron is showing how social reproduction theory is not only a theory that makes sense of how um, exploitation and capitalist valorization work through those mediating labors, uh, caring labors, uh, social reproductive labor that are unrecognized uh, by, by capital, but also of how um, social reproduction theory can work and social reproduction labor can work in ways that make labor empowering and not exploited. So by looking at those uh, unrealized uh, potentials of labor power, I think we have also a very compelling way in which uh, social reproduction theory makes us think about what, uh, in fact, he calls the socialist horizon. And uh, going towards um, my co concluding remarks, I just want to say a couple of things on uh, chapter five. Uh, which is also extremely, uh, I think, useful, compelling, uh, really good at reconstructing uh, um, the, the, the theories that, that uh, he wants to analyze. 
because here Aaron focuses on intersectionality and class. And he, uh, he particularly focuses on class in response to intersectionality theory or theories, it would be better to say, and the many ways in which uh, uh, intersectionality and Marxism have been set very often as opponents and even antagonistic. I think here Aaron does a great job at trying to overcome these divisions uh, at showing that uh, the tradition of intersectionality is much richer than uh, even some Marxists have often claimed. But then um, he writes, and, and this is also perhaps one question that I have uh, for Aaron. Then he writes, the logic of the class relation can be understood as the causal or motor force and one that enables the historical, historical reproduction of capitalist societies. Um, somehow one could think this sounds like a non-intersectional way of thinking about class, gender, and race, um, precisely in uh, putting class as the motor. But then he actually clarifies uh, that class needs to be understood as both a logical and historical relation. This is at least the way I understand it. So class itself, as, as Aaron puts it, class needs to be understood as the relation, as the relation between the work, the logical relation of the working class to the capitalist class, but also as the class experiences. So the experiences working class have that are deeply um, mediated and need to be understood through the differing powers related to gender and racial oppression in particular. I am very personally very fascinated by this um, because I am generally speaking fascinated by this discussion on uh, the logical and the historical uh, as, as uh, the two moments that we need to understand uh, uh, particularly in relation to the role of class, class exploitation vis-a-vis -vis, um, gender and racial oppression. And I think also it's one of the most complicated issues, to be honest, in Marxist theory, uh, as it, it really uh, requires a deep understanding of dialectics uh, and Marxist, Mar Marxist method, uh, um, which, I mean, Aaron, you don't have to answer this because I know it's, uh, it's, it's really, I don't have an answer, it's really complicated. But I just wanted to say, I think this is really key. I think personally speaking, I, I, I really think this is one of the theoretical challenges that we have ahead as uh, uh, Marxists, as, an anti, as also as feminists and anti-racist uh, activists uh, to really deeply understand what does it mean to connect these struggles, to connect these moments of oppression and exploitation together. Um, I think Aaron's book definitely does a great job in this and uh, is particularly in particularly important now. We are going uh, through a, exception, an exceptional historical moment, uh, the, the struggles, the recent struggles um, against the racism uh, obviously are uh, giving us hope in these uh, uh, dark times. But, and, and I think actually the work of Aaron can really help us also understand precisely some of those connections. This is, these are anti-racist anti struggles that are also deeply about class exploitation. It's about how uh, especially people of color and working class people of color have been completely let down and let die by uh, the various governments in, in this pandemic. So I think this work, this is work that really needs to be uh, unpacked and understood deeply. Um, so really, I, I want to close here and, and, and I really just want to say this is an amazing piece of research that anyone interested in social reproduction theory and Marxist theory should read. Thank you very much. That was that was really heartwarming, and, and it feels so good to be to be seen and to be read so well. Thank thank you, Sarah, for for that introduction, and thank you for being here. It's an honor to participate in a conversation with you. And special thank you also to Chris and to Emily, who um, are, are have been tirelessly working behind the scenes um, for for Pluto and, and in setting these kinds of conversations up. Um, so thank you to all, to all three of you. Um, I, I I think that. The hard kernel 
that I've been trying to unpack is exactly what Sarah just ended with. It's the relationship between the logic of capital and the way that that logic gets fleshed out historically and socially. And I think that if social reproduction theory has something valuable to add to the Marxist discourse, it's in how we can trace the beating heart, to borrow a metaphor from Shinsi Arutza, the beating heart of the logic of capital to the lived social experiences filtered through all kinds of relations of domination that capital flows, the capital reconstructs itself through, the capital continuously reproduces as it tries to valorize. So I think we miss a lot about capital if we only hold on to the logic of its valorization and abstract away from all the social relations of domination that give it its color, its shape, its rhythm. So that's, that's what I've tried to do is to try to really motivate with personal stories, with examples of actual struggle, um, how social reproduction theory can, instead of just talking about capital as a logic of exploitation, see that logic of exploitation as instantiated, literally embodied in relations of domination that we need to pay attention to if we're going to organize and then motivate and then actually accomplish the socialist horizon of emancipation. So that's, that's that I think the hard kernel. And, and I think that um, there's been some wonderful confirmation uh, of that kind of attempt at seeing things from we could, what we could call the bourgeois press. Just within the last three days, the Financial Times and the New Yorker have been describing the black uprisings throughout the United States as having a simultaneously a racial and class dimension. And I think that as leftists, we need to not be blind to what is so obviously the case that the exploitations of capital are continuously realized in uneven ways across differently set, differently divided, segmented, conscious elements of the working class. So we got to think through the nature of the working class itself rather than adopt some abstract perspective of an ideal consciousness you should have to be revolutionary. So that's that's what I wanted to say at the start. And since I wrote this book, and I, I think that the ultimate value of theory is in motivating resistance to capital, resistance to other dominating social relations, I wanted to take just a few minutes and describe how I see social reproduction theory motivating anti-capitalist, anti-racist, um, LGBT activist approaches, disability activists, and ultimately feminist approaches to, the, to, to social relations that are dominating today. So just a few lines on each of those, and then I really want to open it up for question and answer. Um, so first, um, social reproduction theory, as, as Sarah Faris just noted, um, really relies on the concept of labor power. Labor power is what gets exploited by the capitalists in order to grow capital. And so it is an anti-capitalist social theory. It is a deeply Marxist anti-capitalism because it sees labor power as the source for capital's continued growth for its self-reproduction. The good news is that labor power is not only and always or exclusively in the service of capitalist exploitation. We can be anti-capitalist because our powers are always and unavoidably for more than the way that capitalists put them to use. We can always do otherwise with our powers. So I think that social reproduction theory has got in the very kernel of labor power itself, a propensity to move towards anti-capitalist positions. I think that holds for, um, we can expand that insight into anti-racist commitments as well. SRT can see racialization, especially anti-black racism um, as socially punishing labor powers that are embodied in black people. And crucially, social reproduction theory, how that has been historically produced and reproduced in evolving ways. We can tie it all the way back to the primitive accumulations of slavery and trace out how the harms, the traumas, the legacies of that violent dispossession evolve in continuously expanding ways today. We can also understand the capacities for black labor power as filtered through uprising, resistance, stealing oneself, um, or all different kinds of resistance to police state capital oppression today. This is to say that we have agency. We make our history, even if not under conditions of our own choosing. And I think we're seeing black led uprisings throughout the country, at least in the US, um, as really resting on, that, resting on that fundamental social fact. 
Next, um, I think that social reproduction theory has a lot to say for and, and to motivate LGBTQIA plus activists. Um, I think the appreciation of history and our agency in it can help us denaturalize really conservative gender norms, conservative orientation norms. We don't need to accept biology as fate because its meaning is socially produced. What it means to be gendered or to have an orientation is not necessarily a form of domination, but it is under conditions of capital and social reproduction theory can tr trace out the histories and legacies why that's the case. So it also insists that we have some self-engendering powers. We can produce ourselves through our capacities for need satisfaction in ways that are different from social compulsion, different from social norms that are imposed on us from childhood. And I think those SRT can see that those capacities should not be rejected as unnatural or only capitalistically determined departures from an original healthy regime of gendering. I don't, I don't think such a thing even historically existed prior to capital. So I think social reproduction theory can, through denaturalizing, um, recognize capacities for self engendering beyond, for, for orientation beyond extremely conservative gender norms and show how those conservative norms are. Um, not functions of capital, but part of the fabric of social relations through which capital validates. Finally, um, uh, next to finally disability activists, um, what I've been describing has rested on our ability to see our powers can be determined in lots of different ways. We do not need to have our powers constrained by capital's demand to use them to valorize. And I think that has tremendous insight and value for disability activists because once we see our powers, our living personalities are dominated by capital, what it means to be disabled, what it means to be disabled, and that's careful, um, it is actually pretty easy, not entirely, but I think a large part of it is, is, can be seen as disability from the standpoint of what capital wants to do with our powers. We can organize the social relations in a way that makes what people can do a source for freedom rather than a source of constraint on the ability to satisfy their own or social needs. I think SRT motivates that set of social relations. Finally, um, from a feminist perspective, SRT is really deeply rooted in Marxist feminism as Sarah has, has noted. Um, who reproduces our labor powers most directly has always um, been a gender determination. So women, and disproportionately women of color um, have been the nurses, have been the, the school teachers, in, especially in impoverished areas. We need to get to, we need to center women and women's capacities for organizing labor power in different ways, really at the center of a social theory in order to politically respond to the ways capital has been dominating and of course in disproportionate and uneven ways. Finally, um, I think all of the, everything I've just said shows that the oppressed through different relations of domination are constrained to socially reproducing themselves, their communities in ways that have to try to sidestep the dominant, dominant versions of compulsion that, logic, that, that capital visits on us. And I think for that reason, oppressed people frequently make the very best organizers with the very best set of politics. Um, and so I think that the capacities generated through having to have different communities of social reproduction, not beyond the scope of capital, but in a sense against it, really creates political opportunities and capacities that should be centered in political struggle going forward. Um, yeah, and, and I, it should go without saying that I don't mean to silo uh, anti-racist LGBTQIA activists, disability activists, and feminists, like we should be all of those things and at the same time. Oh, how do we do, Emily? Do we answer, do we address those questions now? Okay. Um, maybe I will try to answer the first. The second is explicitly for Aaron. Uh, and of course, Aaron, just uh, um, feel free to to, to do the same on this. Um, well, first of all, thanks, Aaron, because I think, yeah, I totally agree with what, what you said. 
um, the question of how do we understand social reproduction in value chains, especially from the fem feminist framework. Well, what I was thinking when I, when I read this question is uh, one specific type of value chains, which are um, migration and especially female migration care chains, so-called care chains. And uh, this is also because this is what, what I work on. And uh, um, I think social reproduction and uh, um, definitely helps understanding these particular, particular types of value chains uh, because it helps us understand, it helps us move uh, from a framework that was conceiving those chains mainly in terms of uh, uh, chains of emotional labor, uh, according to some frameworks, uh, or in fact, uh, chains of labor without a wider understanding of how they are connected in fact to the reproduction and valorization of capital. And I think instead social reproduction theory helps us to uh, really link uh, the migration of women, for instance, from the global south to the global north, but even simply from country to country uh, in order to provide the care labor as deeply uh, embedded and uh, essential to the reproduction of, of labor power and to the, the valorization of capital. And uh, actually, if you're interested, uh, uh, the person who asked this question, there is a, a growing literature on this. And I'm thinking of the work of Eleanor Kaufman, who is uh, um, a geographer, a social geographer, who has actually moved from the care framework to the social reproduction framework. And she's a big name in, in migration studies and in gender and migration particularly. And she explicitly says, uh, we need social reproduction to understand uh, these, uh, these global movements of uh, uh, care labor. And so in that sense, uh, this is just to address perhaps one portion of how, um, or one aspect of how social reproduction helps us understand the value chains. I could add to that. I, I, I think that that's theoretically, like, I think you're absolutely right. And I think social reproduction can and should be used to think through that, but just a, maybe a too personal anecdote, but my mother was working um, and she had to work uh, when I was a child, which meant that after school, I did not have the ability to like get to my practices or get home and take care of the, like walk the dog or like do all the things I needed to do um, to get even sometimes to get to my after high school job. And so my mother hired um, people to come into the house and to help take care of me, especially my younger brother. And in the early to mid nineties, it's no accident that I was taken care of by Nada, Svetlana and Vera, who were from the former Yugoslav Republic or the Soviet Union. Um, that there's, there's a direct connection between like the labor power that was reproduced, that was produced in me uh, as somebody who would then go on to participate in the workforce um, and chains of migration from, uh, fr from Eastern Europe. And so that's like, that's, it's not just a historical or theoretical, like I'm, it's embodied in, in my, my labor power and my, in my living personality as well. Um, I think that's important to recognize. Um, so I think the next question, is, should I read it aloud? Um, can other people already see, okay. It said from Raisa Savrula, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, it says, theoretical question for Aaron. Do you think in this connection between the logic of capital to history is something we need to do by say, re-theorizing or expanding Marx's high level of abstraction in order to address not only value production, but the production of labor power itself? Or should we, should, should we do it in other levels of abstraction and work in how do we connect those different levels? It's a really good question. So I, I think that it's really important to note that value production is an abstract way of understanding how capital itself functions. And we need to keep that question and the analysis of that question extremely clear and precise. We need to have a really precise understanding of how capital as a system of exploitation, as a system of pumping surplus value out of workers functions and in addition to that, 
we need to be able to move down the levels of abstraction to look at how labor power itself is produced and reproduced. In doing so, we should not, I think, I'm on the side of the people who do not think that the production and reproduction of labor power is either necessarily value productive or necessarily not value productive. We need to see all the labor that goes into producing labor power in individuals, like I just told you was done with Svetlana and Vera and Nada for me. Um, and see, are they waged? Are they waged in a way that produces the surplus value for a, a capital expanding firm? And if so, some socially reproductive labor does grow value. On the other hand, sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes it's the exact same, the exact same set of activities. We can imagine a, um, uh, a home healthcare aid working for a for-profit company, working and doing the exact same tasks at work in a way that creates value for capital and coming home, doing the exact same tasks for an elderly relative. And that does not produce value for capital. So that distinction is, I think, important. We shouldn't be saying that socially reproductive labor, the labor that reproduces labor power itself is necessarily analyzable via, via the question of value production. Value production needs to be preserved at a higher level of abstraction as, as a theoretical question necessary for understanding capital as such. Um, and then we can ask questions about how is the organism, how do we organize the production and reproduction of labor power? Is it for profit? Is it not? Is it waged? Is it not? Is it gendered in these ways? Is it evolving on all these different? And those are super important questions. But I like, I like, like the way, Raisa, that you that you separated out the the levels at which we're asking these questions. I think the next question, Aaron, is. Uh... Um, clarification of the same question. I think you are, you answered already. Okay. How do we connect the different the different levels? I, I, I maybe I can speak for a couple seconds about how to connect those different levels because I said it's super important to keep them distinct. Um, I can't keep them so distinct that, that it looks like they're two incommensurate systems. You don't want value production on one hand and labor power production uh, on on the other. Um, and one of the mediating links, as I said, is that some of our labor power production is in fact capitalistically arranged for profit. Um, the, other, the other way to set it up is to try to show how in different ways, production and reproduction of labor power creates what we bring to labor markets. The way that my labor power is produced conditions both the labor power I have and my access to labor power markets through which capital will ultimately valorize. Now, if I've produced as having certain kinds of labor power, but I don't have any access to the markets because of cap like disability or because of racialization or because of uh, you know, any number of reasons, well, well, then we have a specific way, and it needs to be specified, the specific ways that the production of labor power, the reproduction of labor power is tied to capitalist valorization. Some people are excluded. Some people are set at disadvantaged positions for accessing labor power markets. Uh, and we need to think through um, the different ways that that happens. And so that I've maintained that there's a distinction between those two things um, should, should, never, should never mean that they're so distinct that like the, the, the real lived experience um, of having one's labor power produced and reproduced is, is like a part, it's like a, it's, it's a necessary condition for the, any sort of capitalist economy. Um, so so that's, that's the way that I'm gonna to try to connect them. It's in the labor power that we have and then can bring to market. Yeah. There's another question from, from Dan. Um, you frame racial and gender oppression as belonging to capitalism's real history in contrast to its structuring logic. Right? That's true, I do. Um, does that make them contingent? So the question is, is race and gender oppression contingent? Could capitalism exist without race and gender? Okay, so I think we need to be really clear when we're talking about capitalism, we cannot simply mean a logic. Capitalism in no instance can ever be a mere logic. 
the logic of capital is an ideal abstraction away from the actual concrete social relations of domination that make labor power and create it as having or lacking in different ways, accessing labor markets. And so when we ask about whether capital or capitalism can be you know, indifferent to, to or, or it's just the racial or gender domination is maybe contingent to capital. That's, that's a question about the abstracted logic of capital. And at the level of abstraction, you've already abstracted away from race and gender. So you've got your answer to your question baked into the question. If on the other hand, you understand capital, not as the logic that we produce by abstracting away from social relations in order to see what's necessary from the state, from like as exploitation at its root. If instead we actually look at social realities of capitalism in every single instance, we see gender domination and racial domination. So I, I, to call it contingent would be absurd. So I, I, I think that um, constructing uh, the necessity of racial and gendered dominant, dominating relations as, as at the very root of capitalism becomes then a historical question rather than a logical question. And if we do the historical research, we see like that this is in fact how it emerged and in fact how it exists in every instance across its elaboration that we can imagine in some pristine ideal construction that it wouldn't have to just means we've abstracted away from what capitalism actually is. So that's, that's my answer to Dan's question. Can you add something to this um, before we move to the next question? Because Dan's question, can you hear me? Because Dan's question I think is really, really important. And uh, I have been struggling myself uh, personally with this issue. We had a debate also a few years ago with uh, Cinzia, um, Cinzia Ruzza and Johanna Oxala and the Francesca Manning on these issues, um, which I, I thought it was really, uh, I mean, for me it was really, really um, formative and really um, great to have this exchange with them around these issues. I don't think we solved the problem really, um, is because I, I mean, because it's such a big and complicated discussion. But I, um, just to follow a little bit on, on what Aaron was saying, I think one of the, um, um, well, two things. One is, uh, um, I think there has been a certain tendency within Marxism, especially certain, how can we say, orthodox Marxism perhaps, and I'm thinking of the work of David Harvey, um, which is not necessarily orthodox Marxism, but, um, or Ellen Maxins Wood. Um, I mean, I, these two authors come to my, to, my, to my mind because they explicitly say uh, in a way that um, gender and race are, um, they, they cannot, we cannot make sense of them uh, from the, an historical, um, uh, from a, the logical, if we look at the logical and, and ab abstract perspective, we make sense of them just historically. But I think, uh, um, one of the issues that I have increasingly with them is that they keep talking about race and gender and class as systems. And we have this tendency also within Marxism in, in keeping this language of systems, which for me is very Parsonian because I come from, from sociology and is very functionalist. And uh, I think that uh, what Aaron does incredibly well in the book is really to talk about social relations social relations of production, of domination and exploitation. I think this is, uh, uh, this is really, I think helps us to go around to try to solve at least theoretically some of those issues about uh, different systems uh, and uh, actually the ways in which uh, they are, can I say, all constantly and always interconnected uh, logically and historically and experientially because they are social relations. Uh, and not in fact uh, systems in, in this kind of functionalist way. And the second thing, very, very quickly, sorry, is that uh, um, to understand these issues, we need really to understand what, what is Marxist dialectical method to, to put together the logical and the historical. And here is where I personally have my own difficulties because I find it incredibly difficult, incredibly complicated to think it through coherently 
uh, and uh, um, so I'm not really answering this question because, as I said, I have I have my own difficulties with this. But this is just to say I think we have to go beyond some of the inherited categories, perhaps, and frameworks that we have from some Marxists. I will and I will leave it there. I just I I, I become. I think that that's that's totally, we're not going to solve the question of the relation between <laughs> real history <laughs> relations and the logic of capital right now. But one one may, maybe it's too easy for me to say, but one is look, you know, if you want to find if what you mean by logic is an abstraction away from social relations, then of course you're not going to be able to like get the social relations of domination uh, that we describe with the categories of racism and gender gender depression. You're not gonna be able to get them up there because you've already they baked into the question, you've already got that separation. So we either need to think the logic of capital um, as more social and less abstract, or, or create, um, and I haven't yet been compelled by any of the analyses, but there have been attempts to extract a logic from um, social relations. Um, Viewpoint uh, has had um, Viewpoint Magazine has, has attempted in a theoretically rich way to, to attempt a logic um, of some relations of domination. Um, the, the problem with that is that the social relations of domination, as Marx teaches us, historically change um, and are subject to revision through resistance uh, and, through, and through our uprisings and through our reconstructions and through the labor powers and capacities we have to be and do otherwise. And so I'm, I'm also skeptical of trying to extract a stable logic from social relations. Um, let's see. Debates about the pandemic have highlighted how much ableism there is around. From this viewpoint, I think your attempt to clarify the normative stakes of SRT is extremely important. Well, thank, thank you, the Chinsieta 15, uh, a nice handle. Um, I, I, I think that it's really important. We should remember that in the, in the critique of the Gotha voting program, Marx um, ridicules the idea of from each according to their ability to each according to each, until we've revolutionized social relations. We can't simply uh, give back to people the abilities that the produce or, or the surplus or the value that they contribute through their abilities. That would be a disaster. Uh, and, Mar and Marx responds to that political position with vitriol. And I think that has tremendous implications for disability theory. We, we cannot say to each according to their ability, if capital and other relations of domination disable us literally, um, and also in, 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 in all kinds of different ways through access to labor markets psychologically. So, so there's tons of different ways that this insight can be developed for disability activists. And I think it's a rich minefield that requires, um, sorry, not mine, a rich mine um, that requires more unpacking. Uh, I, I can't, I don't claim to have like figured out Marxism or I figured out social reproduction theory for disability activists. I think I've just pointed to some resources in my work. Can you say something more about this in relation to the pandemic? Oh, Do you, would you like to begin, Sarah? I feel like I've been speaking a lot. Um, yeah, I think that that was still uh, linked to your, to the previous question on ableism, right? Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Um, oh, maybe the next question, how would you relate social reproduction in today's zero hours work arrangements? Oh, okay. Um, well, I guess, um, well, I guess the, the, one of the things that we, we see now is that uh, some of the, um, some of the jobs uh, that are uh, in fact organized uh, with uh, zero hours contracts in, in the UK, for example, are jobs uh, directly, um, that are social reproductive jobs and uh, um, professions. And here I'm thinking, um, of uh, um, people, for instance, in the um, who work in restaurants uh, uh, or in the um, food industries, uh, or even people in some of the care jobs. I know, for example, I know also from from research I did here in London that uh, um, people working, some women working as elderly carers, uh, particularly those working for agencies. Uh, 
or recruitment agencies were in fact hired with zero hours contract or cleaners, especially cleaners who are, uh, again, um, who work through agencies uh, and so who actually have contracts uh, because as you know, most of, lots of cleaners don't even have contracts because they might, those who work in private households very often have totally unregulated arrangements. But those who tend to work in more formalized ways, they often have zero hours contracts. Um, so this is an immediate answer that comes to my mind that the ways in which this actually connects to social reproduction. And maybe another way in which we can understand uh, that casualization of labor and this phenomenon of zero hours contract through social reproduction is also um, through the lenses of the so-called feminization of labor. Um, we, there has been lots of talk in, you know, in the last 20 years at least about how uh, labor has been is increasingly feminized, but this I, doesn't simply mean, it doesn't even mainly mean that uh, more women uh, work which is true, but this is not actually the point of the theory of the, of the feminization of labor. What it means uh, more deeply is that uh, the precarious and casual, casualized uh, conditions of work that were, that have been historically reserved for women or for people identifying as women as feminized subjects are now extended to the workforce in general. So I think this is actually an, an interesting way in which we can connect social reproduction, which also talks about the feminization of labor and the specific oppressions of women as laborers and uh, contemporary uh, work arrange arrangements such as uh, uh, zero hours contracts, for example. And I think we can we can add dimensions of racialization and understanding immigrant oppression, immigration, immigrant oppression, and access to labor markets through through a similar lens. And um, I think it's a really good question of, about zero hour work arrangements. That's the that's the limit of the contract arrangement. But you know, low level, um, like low, very low hours, or in the U.S., hours that are just below the threshold at which they need to offer health care. Um, like we can see all different kinds of people getting shunted into, not all different, specific groupings getting shunted, the segmentation of the labor market getting shunted into different kinds of contracts. There is a question from Brazil, Aaron. Okay. Um, where is it? Oh, our social reproduction study group here in Brazil would like to hear more from you about your thoughts on the way Hill Collins conceptualizes the matrix of domination and the way SRT addresses them. Okay, um, so in my chapter on intersectionality, um, I tried to reconstruct um, what I thought was the strongest possible case for intersectionality. And to my mind, that, that really draws on Patricia Hill Collins. Um, I think she's, she's a great theorist and she does not forget about class. She does not claim that um, uh, oppressions are merely siloed in, into brief moments of intersection. Um, she's actually a very rich, rich theorist and it's somebody that I think can be helpful for, for radicals. The, the problem, I think, or, or the way that I think social reproduction theory can integrate Patricia Hill Collins insight and do a bit better is by paying attention to the historical forces that have created disadvantaged labor powers in different ways. So rather than seeing different aspects um, of, of somebody's oppression, we can look at the histories that have caused these kinds of oppressions to combine in, in different ways. And with that kind of historical analysis, analysis of the reproduction and direction of matrices of domination, we have a better political insight. That is, we can, we can understand through the historical direction and reproduction what needs to be changed? What needs to be responded to? And so the way that I've been trying to think about it recently is that we can, uh, social reproduction theory can include an intersectional moment in its understanding of class. When I say that class needs to be understood from the standpoint of social relations, what I mean is we can't just say it's working class. We need to understand the working class as queer, as immigrant, as people of color, as, as more specified than just people of color, but perhaps black or, or Latin. 
um, and then go through, go through the whole different thing. We can't deny the reality of the working class if we're going to build a working class politics. And I think rather than reinvent the wheel, we can rely on the way intersectionality and black authors in particular have helped us see that already. In that way, I can insist that it's important to center class without being a problematic, reductive Marxist. Because what I mean by class is the social reality of intersecting oppressions. Um, what I mean by the social experience of class, the, social lived re the lived social reality of class includes what Patricia Hill Collins is describing as a matrix of domination. I then explain how class, given those realities, contributes to a logic of exploitation, a logic of capital valorization that we need to really overcome if we're gonna have any chance at um, undo undoing any of the systemic social, any of the ongoing social relations of domination. So um, I think um, some versions of social reproduction theory have really just like been anti-intersectionality. Uh, um, and some, I think that that's it's needlessly ungenerous. Okay. <laughs> Why not? So one of the things that I really appreciated in your work, Sarah, is a kind of principled internationalism that refuses to accept any privileging or any advantaging of some segments of the working class, let's say women from an advanced Western capitalist country, um, at the cost of others, at, at, the, at, the, at the cost of sidelining others or shunting them into um, more like dangerous working conditions or undervalued working conditions as, as if doing so was a condition for their own freedom. So I, I, I'm wondering if you can say more about the, the kind of international, like the solidarizing and internationalist approach that I, do, do I sense that appropriately in your work? And can you say more about that? Um, yeah, I'm thinking, um... Well, I, I, I guess your comment, I take it to refer especially to, um, if I think of the book that I published recently, uh, what, yeah, three years ago, um, for example, I, there is especially one um, section which, uh, in a way, I think it needs to be developed further, but is one of, one of one of the sections that I enjoyed the most writing, but that also was very challenging, uh, which is precisely to understand the relationship between uh, um, feminists in the global north and in the global south, uh, but also um, female workers, particularly femi feminized workers in, in, in these different contexts. And one of the things that I try to say is how um, by privileging a certain model of emancipation, which is the one that was uh, um, in a way pursued in the global north, uh, some feminists, including left-wing feminists and including also Marxist feminists have uh, taken this to be a kind of a telos, a kind of uh, a telos of emancipation, um, as if uh, it was dictating the path to emancipation also to other women. And what instead I think we need increasingly to learn from uh, um, other feminists, uh, including for instance, Muslim feminists, but I would say this speaks more generally about other struggles, um, is that uh, we really need to understand those deeply uh, and uh, we need also to uh, accept that our path to emancipation is not necessarily uh, the, the one to be imposed or the, the necessarily the truthful one or the right one. And it is really within struggles and through solidarity. And I think is also what you're referring to through international solidarity and international solidarity that we can work out those uh, different uh, uh, also yeah. possibly and po probably paths to emancipation. Yeah, I, 
I really like those sections in your work because I also have a vision of, of socialism as a set of free social relations. And what freedom will look like depends on the systems of, I keep saying systems, and I, the social relations of oppression um, that, that have been dominating for us given our local histories and, and geographies. So we need to, and I, really, I really enjoyed that approach in your work. And I think you're absolutely right that that gets negotiated out through struggle. That, that gets negotiated out through through having um, uh, like real bonds and contacts of solidarity and mutual support between um, different conceptions of what pursuing socialism looks like. It's not a philosophical or theoretical or conceptual problem. It's a real political one. There is a question. Would you would you please explain Rawls's theory of justice in social reproduction and its impact? in today's labor market. Sure. Um, I, I actually think that Rawls provides a really nice contrast to um, social reproduction theory and how, how we try to go about envisioning things. Um, in, in Rawls, as, as, as many, many of you will know, um, the ideal uh, um, theory of justice stems from adopting a position of pretend ignorance. We have to put on the veil of ignorance and imagine what kind of social relations we could agree to if we didn't know anything about ourselves. If we didn't know that we were raced or gendered or had a certain kind of immigration status in the way that we do, Rawls wants to unpack a logic through which we could um, just come to agree that there are certain sets of um, um, kinds of inequalities that we would be okay with, or there are certain kinds of domination we would radically reject. And in that way, by abstracting away from lived experiences, by pretending that we're ignorant behind a veil or we can't see real material realities. He tries to develop a theory of what justice would look like, a theory of justice evolved directly from consciousness or through an idea that has no contact with um, what we're calling social relations of domination. I think social reproduction theory is a better way of going about doing things. I think if we want to imagine what a good world would look like. We can't pretend to be ignorant of the harms that are actually experienced in disproportionate ways by different people. We gotta be deeply aware and concerned about that and center those voices in our political response, not abstract away from them. We need to do a good job of listening to what people who are suffering from dominant social relations say their freedom would be. Um, I'm aware that extreme restrictions on uh, access to, um, um, both um, state recognition and healthcare exists in, in the UK for trans people. Um, and that has been advocated from the standpoint of, of like doing what's appropriate and liberatory. If you ask trans people, no, or the vast majority of trans people, no. Uh, so, so I think that um, the Rawlsian approach, um, although it's not something I discuss directly in the book, it is actually a fine contrast to highlight what I think is valuable about social reproduction theory. And I think, I mean, as there are no questions, um, maybe just to add a little bit to what Aaron just said, um, I don't know Rawls' fear of justice very well. Aaron certainly knows it much better than me. I don't come from philosophy. But the way I understand it, I completely agree that social reproduction theory uh, provides a much better understanding of uh, certain inju of injustice, including um, racial injustice and, and, and gender injustice more directly in, in, in the case of social reproduction theory, precisely because it doesn't abstract from those uh, very real and very concrete uh, social relations of uh, uh, oppression and exploitation. And to me, um, I mean, to me, Rawls' theory of justice and the, 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 the veil and meth metaphor was always uh, really interesting because in a way, this is precisely how bourgeois uh, theories of justice operate. They, they operate through a veil, through an abstraction of, uh, uh, in a way, um, ungendered, uh, unracial un uh, and uh, uh, equal individuals, uh, which, uh, uh, which is precisely an abstraction as Marx uh, teaches us already from uh, the Jewish question and uh, I mean, from really the early writings and so on, really the abstractions of the state. So in a way, um, 
I think one nice contrast to me to Rawls' theory uh, has always been to read the Du Bois. If you read the Du Bois, one of the things that is really incredibly touching and fascinating about his work is precisely what he describes uh, the experience, his first experience, his first encounter with racism as a little child who um, suddenly is uh, treated badly by a little girl. He must have been six or seven years old. And for the first time, he is made consciously aware of uh, he, the color of his skin and of the fact that the reason why this little girl doesn't treat him nicely is because of the color of his skin. And he says this was precisely like uh, tearing down the veil. Like uh, this is exactly the same metaphor that he uses, uh, but in the opposite way, precisely by saying, if you really want to confront uh, racism or exploitation, etc., you need to tear down this veil. You, you cannot operate uh, with that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how much, um, maybe people have already written about this. I have really no idea. Uh, but I, I always thought it was an interesting contrast and I've used it sometimes also with my students. So I just wanted to repeat this here. I like the metaphor of tearing down a veil. And I, and I think that that's, that's super valuable for seeing through some racist realities. And I, I think in the US context, maybe, maybe even broader, um, a lot of veils have been torn down in the last few weeks. A lot of people are beginning to see themselves as white and as understanding some of the dominance that has been built into their previously unreflected and veiled understanding as white. People are having a critical interrogation of their whiteness in a way that I don't think had been the case, maybe even since the late 60s. And, and that has been um, extremely exciting. That has been an extremely valuable political development. Um, and, and, and I think that, um, that, that we have the Black-led uprisings to thank for that. Oh, okay. Um, I, I would like to say just a few things about the pandemic um, because I, I'm, I hope I'm not right, but I'm deeply, darkly pessimistic about reopening um, as many economies seem to be committed to doing. And it seems so wrong. We, we've just seen what it takes to have a modest reduction uh, in, in infectious rates. And so now that we've done that and seen what's successful, we're going to um, move in a different direction. I, I, it seems frankly absurd to me um, and I'm deeply worried uh, about that. Now from a social reproduction standpoint, um, I, I think that since Mike Davis and, and Kwaman spoke on spillover, we've known that capitalism is engaging in relations of production that due to demands for efficiency and, and maximum ex extraction of surplus labor value creates all kinds of hazardous conditions for workers um, and for viruses to spread from one animal population to another to the workers and then through extremely condensed and, and um, vastly traversed um, supply chains. So from a social reproduction perspective, we can see just how and why this virus has spread and how and why it's likely to not be something um, that's one and done with COVID-19 until we fundamentally change the way that we produce. Um, and, I, and that's, that's one lens, I think, so one aspect of the social reality that, that we're living through that social reproduction can understand that the genesis of the conditions for COVID-19. The other um, is the, this, for some people, head scratching reality that poorer and blacker and more, Latin, more racialized populations, uh, and, and in particular indigenous populations um, are suffering from COVID-19 more than anybody else. Um, and social reproduction theory has the ability to show how and why that shouldn't be head scratching. Like we should be able to see how um, disadvantaged uh, segments of the working, working, working class are housed in, in have access to, to less space in their housing, have um, the requirement to go to work because they're labeled essential. Um, otherwise don't have avenues for social reproduction beyond the waged relation or deeply dependent on those who do and so can't um, socially isolate. So all different kinds of reasons we can uh, uh, acknowledge from social reproduction theory, the, the racialization, the, the racial aspects of COVID-19. 
um, it is magnifying already um, terribly violent social relations. Oh, there is a question. Joshua Panetta. I was wondering if you can specify the, the contra position you're drawing between SRT and abstract theory. There are many strands of theory that attempt to rectify theoretical abstraction. Oh yeah, social reproduction theory is not the only theory that's gonna try to rectify abstract theory. Now, I, I think that social reproduction theory um, is one among others that attempts to draw abstract theory down in, in, into reality. Um, what I particularly like about social reproduction theory's attempt to ground abstract theory is that it grounds it in the way we reproduce ourselves, our needs, our capacities, our labor powers, and the social relations through which all of that's possible. It provides an ongoing, it's not just a snapshot that ties abstract theory to, to a reality. It's a motion picture that shows the genesis and the continued likely development. Um, and so that historical element that, that uh, built into the idea of reproduction, I think is one of the reasons social reproduction theory is, is best suited to respond to the recognition uh, that, that abstract theory is insufficient. Hmm. Closing statement. Well, um, I was wondering if uh, Emily maybe um, Shall we ask people to, uh, to ask their final questions before we do a closing statement, maybe? So if anyone wants to ask something, they can do it now. Yeah, maybe um, one thing, I also want to say something about the, the pandemic and social reproduction, um, which maybe I will use it really as a closing statement. I mean, yeah, just some final words really uh, about all of this. Um, one of the things I completely agree with what uh, um, Aaron, jo Aaron just said, uh, this pandemic really shows the incredible um, analytic uh, power of social reproduction theory, precisely because, as he says, we can understand the virus uh, through social reproduction theory. We can understand why it is affecting some communities in particular, um, and racialized uh, communities especially. Um, but one of other things that I think shows really the power of social reproduction theory uh, in, in, in the present is the way in which uh, um, suddenly we are faced with these, uh, uh, the, the division of labor being uh, completely contested and uh, those uh, traditional hierarchies between what is uh, useful labor and what is uh, uh, perhaps useful but socially uh, stigmatized labor. I mean, those hierarchies are turned upside down. We are in a situation, I've written an article recently about this with uh, Mark Bergfeld. Um, and, uh, what, and, and I think what we try to say in this article, and I think it's really important in the context of this discussion with Aaron, is how this pandemic is really, um, in a way, showing us the, the, the deep um, paradoxes and contradictions and irrationalities of capitalism that puts, uh, that rewards uh, uh, work that in fact is, uh, um, is totally useless. And here I would even use the, the term used by David Greber who talks about bullshit jobs. All the bullshit jobs like marketeer or managers of various types, uh, uh, we can clearly do very well without them, but we cannot do without nurses, without carers, without teachers, without uh, um, uh, people who work in the de in delivery, in the food industry, supermarket employees, and so forth. So all the people who work in social reproduction, in fact, these are now called essential workers here in the UK or key workers. 
And I think there are similar types of, um, uh, of adjectives and, uh, and uh, labels that are used also in other countries. So now there is this recognition, they are called the heroes uh, uh, of, the, of the pandemic, somehow um, trying to also to, to remind of war times, uh, um, but obviously there is a deep, uh, on, on the, so I, I think we are in a situation that presents um, on the one hand, uh, important possibilities for the workers' movement and future struggles, uh, precisely on the front of social reproduction and of social reproductive labor. But on the other hand, there are uh, clearly some um, traps and risks that we need to be aware of. And I think obviously the, the, potential, the potentials are precisely in the, in the fact that the essential nature, the absolutely, um, we, we can really say uh, unavoidable and uh, uh, indispensable, better to say, nature of social reproduction labor is in front of every, everyone eye, every, everyone's eyes. Um, on the other hand, obviously, the, uh, we need to be deeply aware of the fact that this uh, uh, rhetorical recognition is remaining very rhetorical, has not been followed by uh, concrete wage increases, for example, or improvements in working conditions, etc. So I think really, the struggles on the future are going to be really about social reproduction because they are really going to be about the sustainability of this uh, uh, life, the, of this uh, economic model and of this division of labor. And uh, um, so we need to be really deeply aware of, of this in my view. And uh, so in this sense, I think social reproduction theory, and I think Aaron does it in a really commendable job in his book to explain this, is really that theory that uh, can help us not only to better understand the current economic model and, and mode of production and system, system, but also to, to really challenge it through an alternative way of thinking about labor. Thank you, that's, that's really generous, thank you. Um, sure. I guess to close, I'd, I just, um, I want to I want to tie or try to tie it together the pandemic um, and some of the uprisings we've been seeing and I think one of the social consequences of having to reproduce ourselves in this pandemic is that we've seen that our apartments still exist even though we don't pay rent. We've seen that being a landlord's a bullshit job, for the most part. Um, We've seen that um, we can continue to live and continue to operate even when we don't pay back our student loans or medical debt or other kinds of debt. Um, we, we've seen that the need for profit that has been guiding the way we do things um, can actually be thrown out the window in at least some sectors in some instances. So I think, I think it's the case that the pandemic has in interesting ways shown people just in day-to-day -day continued living um, that we can live through different social relations. We can organize ourselves in freer ways. Um, and so even though it has uh, social reproduction, we can understand social reproduction theory, can understand the genesis of the pandemic and the racial harms of the pandemic. I think it can also be used to point towards some of the developing political possibilities as well through the ways that people are, have organized rent strikes or um, even just the level of consciousness, which I don't ever claim it's sufficient in itself, but at least showing people that we can be otherwise. And I think that the pandemic is putting the question for many people to the very nature of capital itself, or at least more people than previously. The second, the second connection is to, to the gen, to the Black-led uprisings. Um, I think that most people, uh, I, I read a poll that um, burning down a Wendy's had more support uh, burning down a, a, the, the third precinct in Minneapolis had more support uh, than, than either presidential option in the US at the moment. Um, I, I think it's not terribly metaphorical to suggest that the black led uprisings um, are, are putting the question to a, a mode of social reproduction rooted in the violatability of black people. I think black people um, in the streets forcing people to hear and recognize that lives matter and to say the, the discrete names of living people, of people who have been killed by the police um, 
is forcing a recognition that we can no longer pr produce society on the premise of violatability of black people. Um, and, and I think that that is um, a new thing uh, that people are grappling with just in the last few weeks. The uprisings are putting the question to the state and its mode of violence, even its control of space, to the extent that we can take autonomous zones and hold them. I, I hope that continues and continues to spread. So I, I think that um, the reason, since, since I completed a draft for the book, the pandemic hit and the Black-led uprisings have hit, and if I had to write it all over again, those would be front and center. Um, but I think that um, those two things are quite hopeful and, and can help flesh out what I've referred to in the book as the socialist horizon of emancipation. The socialist horizon of emancipation being the set of social relations through which we could have our powers and capacities for their own sake, to be recognized and valued for their own sake and used for their own ends rather than for the reproduction of violent social relations. So um, I'm really happy in the last, uh, to, to close by, by focusing on the possible political value of, of the pandemic and, and, and the certain political value of black led uprising. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Sarah, and thanks, everybody else, so much um, for j joining us this evening or this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, if you're interested in reading Aaron's book, you can find a link to it in the description box below, and it's currently available with 50% off. Now, if you've enjoyed this event, please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the notification button so you can see when we go live in the future. Uh, we have an event tomorrow where we welcome Tithi Bhattacharya, Sarah Jaffe, Jesse Hagobian and Kathy Kennedy to talk about policing versus care in the United States. Okay, have a great evening everyone and stay safe. Sarah Jaffe.